mentioned in previous evenings, please come close to me. I know you like to sit at the back, the back rest, but if you if you come close to me, then it gives me a bit more feeling that there are people who are listening to me. Inshallah, not trying to have a bit of a nap at the back. We start by reciting a surah al-fatiha and surah al-ikhlas. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. يا كان عبد ويا كان استعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين نعمد عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد السلام عليكم my dear brothers and sisters Ghazan, uh, do me a favor before you sit down, please. Can you roll this up and put this in the corner so that other people can sit? Jazakallah Thank you very much. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan wa'ina rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Alhamdulillahi lazi hadana li hadha wa ma'kunna li rahtadi ya lawla an hadana Allah. As-salatu wa salam ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina wa maulana. أبو القاسم مصطفى محمد الله صل على محمد وعلى أحد بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين قال الله تعالى في الكتاب الكريم إنك لا على خلق عزيم صدق الله لا لي رزيم I'm honored again to be amongst you in these very important nights or rather evenings of the first. Ten days of the holy month of Muharram, the year 1439 after Hijra, and I welcome you all, and I thank you for coming in to listen to the message of Islam, which was revived by none other than Sayyid al-Shuhada, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. As I mentioned before, and some people keep, you know, are newcomers to this uh, series of lectures, so I'll just you know, give a recap. This is a school of love. Nobody is forced to come here, and I'm not forced to speak out here. I don't have an obligation to come here and, you know, give lectures as such. But I feel as a person who knows a little bit that I have a responsibility and out of love, I need to pass this message on to the people who come here out of love, without any obligation. So you're not getting anything apart from the fact that you have the love of Rasulullah and his holy progeny, and you're here to commemorate the martyrdom of Imam Hussein and the other family members and his companions. So, we've been discussing the noble traits of character, and I've been mentioning quite a few things. Today, I've got a fair few notes with me because there are a few hadiths that I've, I want to convey, and I don't remember all of them. Hopefully, I'll have the sequence correct so that I can pass it on to you, inshallah ta'ala. Now, we were discussing about akhlaq, that's the term for Islamic ethics, that's the Arabic term for Islamic ethics, and we said it from the, word, the letters, the root letters khalaqa, which makes two words, one is khalq and the other one is khulq. Everybody remember all that? I know you're not there, but you know the rest over there, khalq and khulq. Khalq is the outward appearance, the khulq is the inward characteristics of the soul. Now, khalq as we discussed, requires a lot of effort to build up, you know, when we need to have a good appearance, we need to have good diet, exercise, you know, not get into bad habits, all that stuff goes together. And then we evaluate ourselves by looking into the mirror or by checking out with our gym instructor or whoever it is, and we see how we are doing, how we are progressing, you know, keeps us away from illnesses, makes us look good, keeps us fit, all that stuff. And similarly, khulq, requires time and effort as well because it are it is the inward characteristics of our soul and just like anything else to build it up it needs time and effort and attention now the other aspect which was the important aspect that we shared yesterday was how is useful for this world it's very useful that we have a fit mind and body so that we can continue with our responsibilities in this life and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas khulq is something which we develop now, it will keep us, it'll keep us in good stead 
even after this life. It's something which remains with us forever and will keep us in good stead in the hereafter as well, like in the, in the grave, in the barza, and on the day of judgment, it'll, it'll give us good scores, so to speak, so that we end up in the right place, inshallah, ta'ala, all of us. And we discussed all the prophets came to, you know, enhance our character, to work on awakening the human nature, to develop our character for the better. And Rasulullah has said to, uh, is known to have said that, you know, there's a hadith actually from Al-Kafi, volume 2, he says that my ummah will enter paradise based on piety and good moral conduct. Now, he didn't say my ummah will enter based on the prayers and their fasting and their hajj and their charity. It will all count. What happens is when we have piety, all these things happen, along with whatever else needs to be happening in our behavior as well. So, akhlaq encompasses everything. It's on top of everything. And I mentioned in my introductory le lecture as well that akhlaq or the ethics always remain on top. For example, if you look at the field of medicine and look at one aspect which is quite hot nowadays is cloning. We can clone animals. Human beings or the medical professionals or some experts can actually clone animals. So you have one animal, one sheep, which was called Dolly, I think she's died now. But Dolly was the first cloned sheep and they made exact replica of Dolly, the sheep. And it's like having a sister who is an identical twin. So, now, it was possible. Practically it is possible, medically it is possible. By law it was said, yeah, it's okay, you can clone it. But then on top of it sat the ethical committee. And they decided whether it is good to do it or not to do it. Whether it should be given permission for the entire society to go on with cloning like we like, for example, in the society, we are allowed to have paracetamol. Nobody thinks twice about it. You have pain, you have fever, paracetamol. And so it's medically allowed, legally allowed, and ethically also it's permitted. So cloning had major issues. And that's why the ethical committee said, no, we're not going to allow cloning in the general public. There's restrictions placed on that. So the reason I'm saying all these things is because ethics always sits on top of everything that we do. Salah is good, like I said. It's the base, it's a platform to, to develop us. It takes us closer to higher ethical levels. Now, there's another narration. When a man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, <coughs> before I continue, I want to address my young brothers and sisters who are sitting here with me. And I want to say, every time you hear the mention of Rasulullah or any member of his family, like Imam Ali alayhi salam, like Lady Fatima salam alayhi, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein. Whenever you hear me mention them, you must say the salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad with voice. Is that okay? Can you do that for me? For my young brothers. I know the older brothers and sisters, they know this and they do it in any case. It gives me encouragement and even bigger than that, it gives blessings. This gathering is blessed if we say the salawat more and more times. You've got to remember that the biggest guest that we have here is Lady Fatima Salaam Allah. We don't see her and we must be, the young brothers and sisters will be surprised. How can she be here? That means she's here and then in the next majlis and then the next majlis as well. Well, I have done a little bit of research out that might be possible to explain scientifically. There's a thing called quantum physics. Have anybody heard of that? No? You will hear inshallah in the next few years as you go into higher school, okay? It's called quantum physics. And it tells us there's a possibility that one particle can exist in two different places at the same instant of time. Um, there must be scientists here or physicists here. They can explain in a better manner. But this is the gist of it. So people like, you know, who are very full of light, who surpass the normal barriers of humanity, whom Allah has given certain special status, like the Masumin, they possibly are able to do this wherever they want. They can be available at many places at a given instant in time. And science is trying to explain how this is possible. So that is why I'm trying to say that Lady Fatima is here to collect our tears because that is what is going to give us shafa. 
in the hereafter. Now, there's no blank check that everybody who cries is going to get shafat of Lady Fatima, salamu alayhi We have to do other things as well along the way. So, I was going to say a narration about a, a man who came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma sallallahu And he said to Rasulullah that, what is the religion? What is the religion of Allah? And Rasulullah replied, by a small sentence, good moral conduct. That was it. And then this man asked again, from the side, left side, right side, from the front, from the back, kept asking again and again and again. And Rasulullah said to him, oh, and looked at him very long and said, oh man, you know what? Religion is actually not being angry ever. Because maybe Rasulullah had found out or gauged that he was trying to make him annoyed by asking the same question and again and again at different points. And he's trying to annoy Rasulullah. Because the answer Rasulullah had given was good moral conduct. Controlling anger is one of the biggest types of good moral conduct. It is one of the noblest traits in a character of a person. If you can control your anger at a lot of provocation. You know, we hear all the time amongst families, brothers and brothers, sisters and brothers, sisters and sisters, they fight amongst themselves. Why is the fight happening? Because somebody is disagreeing with somebody else. In the eyes of parents, it is a small thing, but for the child, it's a big thing. So in their mind, it's a big thing. And they want to fight, they're angry at it, and they want to fight. As we grow older, we are supposed to be able to control our anger. Amongst our families, within our families, in school, in the offices, in the workplaces, in the playgrounds, everywhere. Controlling anger is the biggest thing a person can do in the face of provocation. It is a very noble trait of character to be able to control your anger. And I'm not saying that, you know, the provocation might be genuine. You have a genuine sense of anger. But how you react in that anger is important. You know, anger is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to every human being. But how you react in that anger is the making of a man. And that is where human beings have been given intellect, which is not amongst animals. If you see two lions, they get angry, one of them fights with the other and subdues the other by killing. That's how it happens in the animal kingdom. Survival of the fittest. But in human beings, it's not the case. The fittest and the most strong person is the one with the strongest intellect. The one you know who can run people by their brains and make them go around their finger is the one who is the most powerful. You'll notice it everywhere. In every workplace, in every playground, the one who uses the mind more smartly is the one who is the strongest. You can be as powerful, you can be a big bodybuilder or whatever, you can be a boxer or martial arts artist, doesn't matter. The one who controls your brain is the most powerful. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The important thing that I want to point out here in this, in this little aspect about anger is that you tend to get angry with people, you know that they're not going to be able to hurt you that much. Or even they hurt you, you have a mechanism of control somewhere or the other. For example, if it's your older brother you're angry at, even though he's stronger, you know he's not going to hurt you that much. Because if he hurts you, you're going to go to mom and dad. And they're going to sort him out if he tries to hurt me. So, people tend to get angry at people who are normally, you know, slightly weaker. Try getting angry at the boss at work. See what happens. You dare not. Even if you're most honest, he's the most ruthless boss, he's the most unfair person, you'll still have to manage it somehow or the other. That is not something to be very, you know, proud about or very happy about. Because you have no choice. Your anger has to be controlled, otherwise you lose. The successful person is one who gets angry at somebody who is weak and forgives him and passes by and uses his intellect to deal with that situation, explains it or let it, lets it go and uses another opportunity to come and address that situation and then deals with it and exposes the folly of the other person and yet without insulting that person. That is a smart person, that is an intelligent person, that is a successful person. A lot of people might not agree with you, especially who are people who do not adhere to the Islamic ethics. They say, you know, if he's been unfair to you, you have the right to be unfair to him. 